You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another awesome edition of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. My name is Rob. And the energy is here to play. Well, that's a good day. We got some damn energy today. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to be like the... You, eh, never mind. I'm not going to bring it up. It'll probably piss somebody off. But anyways, I'm super glad to be here with you. I hope you're doing great. I hope you're having a great day. I hope you enjoy the show. I hope you will send in the question that's on your mind because you haven't yet. <laughs> and a lot of other people are thinking the same thing that you are, but you won't pick up the phone or whatever it is, the computer, and call us and tell us what your question is. It's not going to get answered, most likely, if you don't tell us what your question is, right? So I guess you can just hang out and keep your question to yourself, or you can go to AskDroneU.com and ask us your question, because we'd really love to hear from you. That's what the show is all about. Well, on that fiery note, uh, that'll bring us right into what we're discussing today, which is actually uh, quite interesting. We're going to deep dive. We're going to deep dive into these American drones. We've got a very specific question that's asking and really kind of uh, diving into, hey, is there an American drone out there that can give us what we're used to as far as price point and features? Is there something competitive and comparable? And if there's not, what's the next best thing, the closest thing? You know, we have discussed American options before. For, but not really in depth and detail and so we've got some great uh some great stuff to discuss today and again i agree with the energetic request from rob that uh if you have a question go to askdroneu.com and get those questions in um but let's go ahead and get right to today's question which is brought to you by a shameless plug from here at our flight crew at drone you as if that ever happens. Carry on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so what I want to say is, as the economy reopens, you know what else is reopening is our in-person trainings. We've got some trainings scheduled here in Albuquerque. We're also putting some trainings um, elsewhere in the country uh, to, to do some in-person trainings. We also have our mapping boot camp that actually starts today, so it might be a little late to sign up for that one. But join us for flight mastery, flight operations. Look, if you're looking to build confidence and you really want to have all the skills necessary to essentially become the regional or local expert in your area, to have the skills that pay the bills, to be able to fly in close proximity with confidence, know the systems and routines. This way, emotion doesn't overcome your ability to deliver with quality to your clients. Because remember, you're only as good as your last job. So join us for one of those trainings. Check it out, thedroneu.com. Hey guys, huge fan of the show. Uh, I love what you're doing. I did have one question yesterday. You guys had discussed uh, a few of the American made drone models and the need for American made drones. And I wanted to know what, in your opinion, are the best American made drone models for the commercial industry, like um, the building industry, roof inspections, real estate, that sort of thing. You know, practical drones, uh, you know, similar. I currently have a, a, a DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual. And and so I wanted to kind of get your ideas on American-made products that are similar, not only in function, but also in price point. Again, I love the show. Um, love what you're doing. I recently got my Part 107 and discovered you after that. And I wish I had discovered you before. Uh, keep up the good work. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Gordon. Really appreciate it. And uh, we're just glad you discovered us whenever you did and glad that you got your Part 107. That's uh, Pretty cool. So congratulations on that. Actually, congratulations on a pretty solid drone that he's got already, right? That's You're doing all right with that sucker. Um, one of the things that I noticed, Paul, and you'll get into this as you were kind of doing some research prior to the show about American drones, number one, there's a lot more of them than I realized. That's true. But number two... Well, there's a lot more prototypes, shall we say, because remember how few of them that are actually available to true. purchase right now. No, that's true. But also secondarily to the number of, I guess we'll call them prototypes, is how expensive they all are. So that's going to be a big hurdle. I think it is going to be a big hurdle. And, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about uh, pre-show that we, we didn't get time to discuss is, you know, I always used to be in this camp that I really don't understand how some of these drones are going to sell when the overall market and price point is is rather low. You know, we're talking, say, two to five grand to get a an amazingly commercially viable system that can do creative work and it can do technical work. And I've always been in this camp, Rob, where I've always thought, you know what, if you have a drone that 
that's 10, 20, 30 grand, you're just really not going to break into the market with that. Um, what do you mean by that? You're not going to break into You're the not going to have a mass consumer market that's going to support R&D to get a better version of that drone uh, for enterprise use or even just a solid commercial use. Because, I mean, okay, here, here's what I'm saying, right? <clears throat> here's what I'm saying. DJI has turned into the Comcast uh, equivalent of drones. And what I mean, Ooh. what I mean by that is that Comcast, like DJI, offers a stellar product to their consumers, their recreational internet users. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Nice. So I mean, like literally my internet at home, I threw 300 down, you know, 30 up. It's not, it's not symmetrical. So it's not as good as most of what probably you urban dwellers have, but it's great, you know, and then you come to the office and the reliability is about half and we pay twice as much. And it's kind of the same thing with DJI enterprise systems, you know, the 210, the 300 and whatnot. Uh, you're paying three times the cost, if not four or five or 10 times the cost. And because a lot of these, uh, these groups, these programs are hiring pilots that don't have a lot of experience, DJI has really dumbed down the features and really made it for more entry level pilots and whatnot. But in oversimplifying things, they've made them less reliable and, you know, less safe, literally. And so DJI is like Comcast in that, you know, whenever you go enterprise, you get half as good of stuff for, you know, double the the price point. Um, but even with that double the price point, these other American drones are not coming anywhere close to those enterprise price points that DJI offers. And I mean, here is the example. You mentioned that the caller has a really good drone to get started with. Couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Like picked, picked a phenomenal uh, drone to, to really take on a lot of different jobs. But we've got the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual Advance sitting here on the table. So if you're listening, uh, we are showing it. We put a cool skin on it thanks to our good friends uh, who are firefighters in the largest city uh, in the United States and are helping us with our new props public safety program. And so we've got this cool skin on it. It's a killer 48 meg megapixel camera. It's a killer thermal 640p sensor. So it's a large sensor for such a small drone. And the reason I'm bringing up all of these statistics is if you compare this to, say, the NDAA approved Autel Evo 2 Dual, right? Not an American drone, but, you know, it's NDAA approved. So technically you could fly it. That said, you know, you're getting half the camera sensor for five grand more. I mean, you're paying, you know, the Autel Evo 2 is almost 10 grand. And again, you get half the sensor, half the capability, no sensor denied flight mode. So it's less safe and you're paying more, you know? Yeah. So, so Not that this is cheap. But relatively. Yeah, it's a solid point. So for anyone who, <laughs> who's not familiar with what Rob is saying is a normal Mavic is going to run you, say, let's just say ballpark two grand, right? This Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual Advance costs us, what, seven? 7,000? With a couple extra batteries, yeah. Yeah. Well, you got to have those, Rob. Yeah, you got to. You got to have those. I just um, like to give the people the details, you know. Well, well, here's another detail. How come you buy a skin from the decal girl and you only get one skin Per, for one battery, you know, we've got three batteries. I need multiple cool looking batteries here, Rob. You know so are you saying? blaming me or the decal girl? The decal girl. Okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> that was a little fuzzy on uh, that. I'm sorry. I mean, but you may, maybe I should have asked for a couple extra skins for batteries. No. That makes a lot of sense. It's okay. It's honestly not that big of a deal. The only one who was upset was our executive producer, but he'll live. <laughs> <laughs> he had a good point. But you know what? It was his idea to order the skins in the first place. Anyways, I'm not going to throw him under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> we almost got Rob to throw someone under the bus. <laughs> oh, we're no. getting close. <laughs> love you, Hoel. Not that you listen to these, but I love you anyways. <laughs> but um, it brings up a really good question. You know, tell us another drone that's foldable, that's portable, that's a sub 400 millimeter open full dimensions that offers this capability, this reliability, uh, that offers a sensor denied flight mode, that offers, say, 20 minutes of flight time, no matter the environment that you're flying in. But name another drone that has all those things too, but can also fly at a reasonable distance. And I'm talking about, you know, 1,500 to 2,500 feet out. That's still technically line of sight, right? So you factor all of those things in and there are some good American options. You know, we've discussed Airpeak. We have discussed the FreeFly Astro. Uh, what was the other one that we discussed on that show? It's probably the Evo 2 as well, the Autel Evo 2. Um, but there are, just as Rob said, there are a lot of new American drones. Oh, how could I forget Bobby Watts' Prism? He's, uh, I think, the only guy who's actually delivering 
mm-hmm. these new American drones, right? And so that said, you know what? This brings up a really unique point that I didn't think of, and I just want to switch track to briefly, Rob, which is this company that he mentioned, they have their waiver until June to yeah. operate DJI. There's a chip shortage, and no one is making American drones. And oh, yeah. It's May 18th. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he meant June 30th. I, don't I, know. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Of, of 2022. Yes. So. <laughs> really? Well, I mean, seriously, we know that the silicone chip issue, and this isn't just GPUs, right? This is just broad based microchip production, is under a significant supply chain shortage. I mean, you've got thousands of F 150s parked in a random parking lot ready to be finished. You've got, um, you know, a lot of drone manufacturers who are are struggling to get what they need. You've got uh, even other car manufacturers who are struggling to get the chips that they need. Frankly, it really begs the question of, is there a reliable, uh, amicable solution at the current price point and feature point that an American drone can offer? And I don't, Rob, I'm not sure there, that there's anything physically out there yet they could do it. There's one, there's one drone that we know of that is being delivered that could potentially provide the solution, but it doesn't compete in price. And the camera sensor, uh, I, in my humble opinion, it doesn't come close. Um, but this camera sensor, I feel like is made for the audience that it serves. Albeit, I would argue that once again, a lot of these, um, American slash NDAA manufacturers, I think really miss the boat on the entire camera issue. And I think that they really, I think, you know, the biggest thing in marketing is knowing your audience. And we're seeing a lot of these drones in the American market that are zoom cameras. They're normally dual sensors, right? Thermal and zoom. But once again, a lot of data is being captured autonomously. A lot of data is being used for mapping, for Overwatch, for all these other, you know, uh, uh, very real life applications. And none of these manufacturers other than, um, well, I would actually say a lot of these manufacturers, I feel like haven't really hit the nail on the head yet, Rob. They haven't created a drone that has a great sensor, a large sensor, uh, so one inch or greater, that's a 20 megapixel base, but could also do zoom, you know what I mean? Or it could have a removable payload so you can do mapping with a fixed lens, right? Because focal length, if it changes, you can't map. So, well, you can map, but you just don't get a very good map. Um, but that said, it, it really seems like no one is really hitting the nail on the head, which is fascinating knowing how much Autarian is focusing on the importance of camera sensors. So mm-hmm. for everyone out there, a lot of these American drones are powered by the Autarian Cube system and SkyNode, which are two separate things, by the way, that I have uh regrettably and erroneously used synonymously lots of big words to talk about a big giant mistake from paul okay <laughs> uh but yeah, it happens to the best of us, right paul. uh but that said you know with autarian focusing so heavily on their sony relationship there's a massive opportunity to get a powerhouse drone out there mm. that can really offer the creative flight characteristics that you need to fly on set, but you could also use that same drone to get a killer map, you know? And we have that right now. It's the Inspire too. Like it, I mean, literally, we have that right now. Um, so that said, I, that big long diatribe was just that I don't think that these American manufacturers are nailing their audience, even though Autarian... I think is doing an extremely good job as far as figuring out what the needs of the audience are. So basically, Gordon, stick with your Mavic for now, right? I mean... Well, and I mean, I think this brings up an important point, Rob, which is that I think for him specifically, because he's in critical infrastructure, right, he is going to be limited in the drones that he can use. The whole NDAA aspect is very real for him. Mm. And I just want to reiterate once again that for most of our listeners... Um, unless you fall under the NDAA's provisions, you still don't need to get an American drone. And I don't see anyone rushing to get these things anyway, because once again, there's not really anything out there that comes close to competing on price or features. 
And so yeah, and so I mean, do you want to run through any of the drones that are out there, well, or do you I, not even no, want to go I, there? I do want to run through them, and I want to get to I don't that. Mean to I rush just you. I just wanted to also, you know, get to the point that look, you know, this security issue is something we've talked about a sure. lot, and it does affect users, users who are in the private industry as well as the public industry. But it also, I want to say that it that doesn't represent everyone. It's actually, I would argue, a very small minority of users. Um, and so, you know, we're going to go over what is available right now and what those options are. It's going to be vastly different from what you are, all are used to. And for those of you who are forced to change over from Chinese made aircraft to NDAA approved aircraft, you might be significantly stunned as far as how far behind, um, a lot of these aircraft really are. And and that's why I also wanted to bring up the issue of audience. Yeah. Because we're seeing the same trend with these American NDAA approved drones as we're seeing with DJI and as we're seeing with uh, Apple as well, which is dumbing things down so much, like, you know, like really reducing the controllability, the flight characteristics, the tilt on the gimbal, all these small changes that are supposed to make it quote unquote easier to fly, but dumb things down so much that you actually completely eliminate the value of an aircraft. And so perfect example, just for visualization's sake, is take a Mini 2, right? A Mini 2, which is an amazing drone that you could fly inside or out. You have one parameter on that Mini 2, which makes it nearly impossible to fly well inside, which is the automatic landing feature. And so when your stick moves below, say, 25% past the midpoint, when you're down on the elevation stick, the drone just automatically wants to land. It doesn't allow you to make aggressive or abrupt changes, which mm. are very necessary when you're flying inside. Yeah. So anyway. And, I, and you can't hack around that or? You can. And I got a video coming out on that here shortly. So. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I had to check this morning that it was, uh, that it's hackable. It is. I found the parameter. So I'm going to come out with a video here shortly. I think. A, Sweet. A lot of people in public safety are really going to dig this video. So. And it's not, it's not like a cool production. It's just a very simple, quick fix that makes the drone really usable to fly. Yeah. Inside. Yeah. So. No. Um, that said, let's get into these drones. Okay, so there's a couple new drones that we want to talk about. Uh, you know, we've spoken about the Sony Airpeak, not really American, but it is NDAA approved. Look at the flight controller and look at the um, the VTX. We can see that it's NDAA approved. You know, a lot of these American drones uh, that are approved, the blue SUAS, are powered um, by uh, Autarian's flight controllers. So that said, the one drone that we know of right now that is approved, that comes close, okay, it comes close to what people are used to, but it's not quite what people are used to, is the Vantage Robotics Vesper. And the Vesper folds up just like a Mavic that you're used to. It's got a 30-minute flight time. It has a triple camera, so it's got dual EO sensors and a thermal sensor. But for those of you photographers and videographers out there, this is not really going to be uh, the drone that you're going to get great video with because you're literally limited um, to an 8-megapixel still, and the sensor is literally 3840 by 2160 uh, PI, uh, which as many of you know, is right, r like right by 4k video. <laughs> it's kind of like the reason we don't use video to do drone mapping. Cause you take a 20 megapixel sensor and turn it into an eight megapixel with video. So this aircraft comes close in price point. It comes close in the, most of the features that people are used to easy to operate low and slow, good controllability distance. And Rob, here's the key part. You can actually buy it right now. That's a huge leg up <laughs> in this world right now, actually. Uh, it's but it's not cheap. You could say that a hundred times, Rob, because it's very true. I mean, there are here we are, what is it, four months later after doing the American show, we were all excited about the Astro. It's not out yet. We we're all excited about Airpeak. It's not out yet. Um, I would bet a lot of money that at CES 2022, we see all these drones and it's almost like 2020 never happened. And, and here's all the new drones that were supposed to be here in 2020, but they got a year break to be able to, uh, to make their aircraft work, which is actually kind of funny because not to get political here, but if China did really release 
the coronavirus, they actually really hurt their drone industry by doing that because <laughs> they gave all the Americans a leg up. Thank you. So <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> but um, the Vesper, again, foldable, good controllability range. It's got a remote like what you're used to. It's not too big. Um, it does fly a little bit slow, right? So we we're talking about a lot of these drones doing the same thing that DJI is doing, similar to how DJI thinks they're Apple, right? The simpler, the better. Not always. Sometimes if you oversimplify, and Rob knows this because I'm so guilty of this, but if you oversimplify, you make things more difficult. So... That said, how much do you think the Vesper is, Rob? Um, six, seven, eight grand. You, you're uh, kind of right on the money. You know, if this was uh, the so price, I give a range, give this myself was, a better chance. If this was the Price Is Right, you would definitely be the closest. That's five for sure. to fifteen thousand. <laughs> um, it looks like uh, the Vesper UAS with the ground station bundle on 1.8 gigahertz is $8,000. Um, now, if you don't want to go to 1.8 gigahertz and you want to use just a traditional 2.4 gigahertz signal, um, you know, you're at 7,700. Uh, if you are in public safety, you know, a lot of public safety love to have redundancy. You can buy two, two Vespers plus the ground the ground station and one remote for 13,000. Well, and really redundancy particularly in that environment or in that paradigm is it's necessary. It's very important. I agree. You almost have to think of it in terms of two. True. Whether it's two of these or or one of these and one of something else. But also I so it's it's pretty rare at least for me to see drones in, on the 1.8 gigahertz platform. Doesn't that require some other FCC approval, registration, something to be able to use that? Uh, you know, if you remember from a very long time ago, uh, from the days of Peter uh, being here, we talked about flying on 1.7 mm -hmm. uh, because one seven was a good alternate uh, to the 2.4 range. In all honesty, uh, oh, look at this. This configuration uses a government band of 1.8 gigahertz radio, which can only be used with appropriate FCC authorization. Oh, there you go. So there's the answer right there. Um, but honestly, as a pilot with a lot of experience in watching other pilots have flyaways, uh, I would love to fly on 1.8. <laughs> like, I want to get my FCC authorization just to just be able to, to not that. deal with interference. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. So, I mean, when you think about how many Wi-Fi routers are black, Lasting on 2.4. It's just, uh, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Moving on to other solutions, though, as many of you know, the Astro is probably the most capable when it comes to technical and creative solutions. The only problem is it's, it's not out yet. So uh, you can't buy it. And we're going to stop talking about it because people seem to be super pissed that this amazing drone uh, is kind of now following the same uh, lines of the 3DR solo. Uh, maybe we should call Colin Gwynn and ask him what happens next. That's, ooh, <laughs> ooh. Well, that's... <laughs> Come on, buddy. I'm Come not going to go that far. I'm not going to go that far. <laughs> uh, we just haven't seen it yet. I mean, No, it, we haven't, no. Right? And so, I'm just being um, facetious, I think is the right word. So, But hey, it's going to carry that camera. That's got to make you happy. Maybe a little pejorative too. Um, well, yeah, it does make me happy, especially since I moved up to full frame myself with the A7C, uh, which we're going to have in the new real estate course. Holy cow, that camera just makes life so easy. Um, but uh, yeah, the Astro would be amazing. As far as price point, we do have those price points. Uh, they have varying price points dependent on whether you buy the camera with the Astro or uh, however, you know, you set up your Astro. If I remember, camera and drone was like nine ninety nine nine, right? I, he's he's on the website right now. So um, I'm not seeing prices though. If I remember, so you're saying ten grand. I want to say it was ten grand, like without without the camera and I think it maybe was 15 with the camera I can't remember exactly um, but it doesn't matter because you can't buy it so whatever uh, next next is the quantum systems vector scorpion vector is the name of the fixed wing scorpion is the name of the y-shaped drone maybe the coolest of all of them it is I would argue that it is probably the coolest of all of them but I would like to see this thing fly in person. Of course. Um I know uh I know our good friend in Utah is selling the Trinity drone which is like the big brother to this particular drone. Um but the Quantum Systems again it has uh either a dual or a triple sensor. 
Um, you know, your EO is going to be, again, very low quality. Here, it's only going to be 1080p, but you get a 20 times optical zoom, which is pretty cool if you think about it. Um, there are various camera payload options, and they do offer uh, essentially a, uh, what is it called, interchangeable payload system, meaning that you can essentially take the nose off of this drone and get different sensors uh, if you have different you know, uses essentially. So from a mapping perspective, which is obviously super important to the industry, it seems like this is extremely, or at least has the potential to be extremely versatile because you can cover big swaths with the fixed wing versus, and I, I don't know about the, the cameras, obviously that's important, but in terms of the functionality of the drone itself... So, um, actually, thanks to our thanks to a good friend of ours, uh, Trent Cough Cough, um, I would actually say that the big brother to this Scorpion system, the 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 Trinity F ninety, would actually be the drone for mapping, um, okay. because it doesn't have a zoom camera; it has a much better sensor for mapping. Um, and so, again, when you're th this vector Scorpion. These, these drones are really made for government. They're really made for enterprise inspections. But again, a lot of people, mm. I, I would argue that we're, I don't think that there's actually a clear uh, trend as far as inspections including mapping or not. But if your inspections did include mapping, this drone, the Vector Scorpion, in my humble opinion, n the answer would be no, Rob. No, it would not be good and for mapping. And that's because you can't get the, the right sensor for it? That's right. To you fit would, on this platform? You would actually have to move up to the the Trinity F90+. Plus. See, the, the Scorpion UAS has very different payload options. Got it. Now, if we had a great camera sensor for mapping, then the answer to your question would, yes, Rob, this Vector Scorpion, whatever name they're giving it, uh, by Quantum Systems would be an extremely versatile drone. Why? Because you can fly it as a fixed wing. You can fly it as yeah. a, a Y-copter. You can go back and forth. Um, although they really killed the value proposition without adding a mapping sensor in there. Yet. So, yeah, I think that's a, probably a solid point. As soon as they hear this, they're going to be like, huh, why don't we just take the F-90 camera payload and offer it with the Scorpion? Bingo, guys, bingo. Seems doable. Back to the talk about audience. All right, so um, there are some other solutions out there as well. Uh, one drone that I really want to try out and fly myself is the Teal Golden Eagle drone. Now, this is approved under the Blue uh, UAS program from the United States government. Um, and I actually think that this is one of the most capable drones, quote unquote, word on the street, uh, as far as all of our good friends that uh, give us the down low on the down low have told us, though, that it flies like a boat. And uh, I would say that the whole flies like a boat, that characteristic might have to be taken with a grain of salt because more and more drones fly like a boat. <laughs> Even DJI's new consumer stuff flies like a boat. So, I mean, how important is it that it flies like a boat? Uh, it depends on your client, right? Because we know with other drone manufacturers like the American-made Easy Drones, right? They are so far ahead of American competition. It's not even funny. Um, you know, I, if I remember correctly, they had to build a drone that could take off and get on target within a certain range. I want to say it's like one click within 60 seconds. So their Falcon hauls booty. Like, I mean, but then again, they have an engineering team that's just unparalleled. I mean, Easy Aerial uh, is just really crushing the game when it comes to tethered drones, when it comes to tethered, untethered drones, the hybrid drones, we call them, and also just uh, government-grade aircraft. There's no one who's able to actually produce at the scale that they are producing. Yeah. It's, I mean, the proof is in the pudding, so. They're getting the contracts. And then that's where the pudding is. Yep. <laughs> so, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that said, the other drone that is American made and uh, many people are aware of is the Anolfi USA. Now, there's Fly Like a Boat, Rob, and then there's Flies Like a VW Bug from the 60s. In the water. Yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> huh, okay. So that that not a fan of, uh, the, of the way it flies. Well, I think that, and you know, I think that you make a really good point, right? Um, there, as many of you know, I'm not very excited about a lot of these aircraft, and it has shown. It has shown in classes. Even our Skydio Don't Crash course, our producer was like, "Paul, you have got to lay off." 
the the crap talking like it just shows so much that you really don't like this drone and I'm like well it's a principal issue you know and he's like yeah but what about people who just want to fly it and I'm like that's the problem with America right now is that we are so focused on serving people who don't know what they want that we are willing to di digress as a society to serve those people. Ay, 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 ay. I know that's a big, I, I know what that's if a, you just want to fly the drone because it looks cool and it's fun. <laughs> you're getting y'all philosophizing I on I am us. philosophizing because <laughs> you should know how to be able to avoid an emergency. We are pilots, right? That's why they, the FAA deemed us as pilots, right? We are ultimately responsible. Okay, just making sure. What if I'm sure. out here? It don't matter. Well, you it like doesn't matter because there's not going to be any My effort. English? Uh, mm -mm. <laughs> There's mm. not gonna be any what? No, no, I'm not. I'm not finishing that statement. Okay. I had to. Uh, cr I had to check myself before I wrecked myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anywho. So okay. Right. When I Anolfi. mean Anolfi USA, when I mean flies like a boat, and then VW bug, I really mean that. We've had a a couple Anolfi USAs at trainings. And in my humble opinion, they are just so underpowered. They offer the closest thing probably to a Mavic that you can get. But Rob, I mean. It's like if you were driving an F-150 with a four-cylinder motor. Does that make sense? Like, okay, it, gets, it, it can get up to highway speed, but if you need to pass a truck on a, on a big hill on the highway, ooh, not happening. Yeah, which is why you don't find F-150s with four cylinders in them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's also why you don't find a lot of Anolfis. But hey, who am I? Um, I also don't want to trash uh, Parrot, a.k.a. Airbus, because they probably have the biggest propensity for success, if you think about it. Hmm. They've been able to mass produce. They have a product that works for people. Their system also has a zoom, like highly capable zoom. You know, in their marketing, they talk about being able to see the Eiffel Tower from 17 miles away. Um, so, I mean, like they, they have a dual, dual payload as well. But that's the thing. Once again, these macro trends, dual, triple payloads, not a lot of good mapping sensors. The video out of these drones is super compressed compared to what you can get from other drones. And the price points are really high. You know, I mean, they're, 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 they're really, really high. And yeah, I mean, it just, uh, oh, so, okay. To answer the question of what drone could actually produce what they need to do, um, I, I would say that the only drone that they could actually buy right now and service their needs right now would be the Vesper by Vantage Robotics. Hmm. Um, and I say that too, especially over the Skydio's enterprise platform, now that I've been able to get my hands on one of those, I now know why most people uh, are refraining from purchasing that aircraft. And it really blows your mind why Skydio continues to use the Parrot remote and whatever VTX system they're using because it's just so subpar compared to every other solution out there. In terms of connectivity and maintaining it. Yeah, as yeah. far as being able to fly a thousand feet out and to do a simple mapping mission, as far as being able to fly 900 feet out and get a great shot, you know, that, that's not a far distance. That's to the end of the park. You know yep. what I mean? Like it's not far at all. Uh, and you can't even fly that thing uh, to the end of the park because of all the interference. So I think Skydio is, has a large propensity to be successful as well. I think their biggest issue is going to be camera sensors and visual or VTX uh, transmission distance. I think that's going to be their two biggest hurdles that they have to overcome. I know their government edition has, or their military edition has the encrypted, highly capable VTX. Well, I think to keep selling good drones uh, and for Skydio to be uh, competitive, especially since Skydio today raised the price of the, the, the two, the Skydio 2 is now $1,400. And that does not include a remote, by the way. So Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Remember how you have to buy the remote separate? No, I remember that part. Yeah. I didn't know they raised the price though. Um, so, I mean, again, you've got all these drones that don't, their uh, camera quality is half. Transmission distance, it's not very good. Um, it's not what you're used to. Um, and then when you think about, uh, you know, the uh, characteristics, characteristics of flight, the maneuverability, the stability, a lot of these drones really have a long way to go. They really do. That's also why I was so excited about FreeFly because FreeFly, in my humble opinion, they have figured out the exponential engineering that needs to go into the PIDs 
And the uh, for those of you who haven't built on a PX4 or a Cube, the PIDs are essentially these very minute details that affect how the motor spins, how fast it spins, how the aircraft responds to the IMU. Um, when the aircraft has no input from the pilot, what does the brake actually do? Does it reverse the pitch? Does it bring the drone to a stop? Does it include elevation because you're losing lifting surface? I mean, Rob, the, you... It, it, you could see if you flew both drones next to each other, you could tell right away that the engineering that went into the software of FreeFly is exponentially uh, better for controllability, maneuverability, stability than the Skydio. That said, FreeFly hasn't done anything along the lines of Skydio when it comes to flying through its own point cloud. Yes, that is an amazing feat. And Adam, you deserve all the credit in the world. That really is awesome. I would just say, why not let the pilot be in charge? But that brings me back to FreeFly. With their articulating propellers as well, right? It's not a collective pitch, as I erroneously said, but it's more of like a uh, combined pitch between the rotors. You have so much more control of that drone, yeah. whether it's got a light payload or an extremely heavy payload. And they've adjusted the, the PIDs, the tuning on that aircraft, so that it doesn't matter whether the pilot is used to flying heavy payloads or not. The aircraft responds proportionally to the weight that it is it is carrying. Gotcha. And the ability, I mean, you look, you can go 60 miles an hour with an Alta, the Alta X, right? You know this, you've seen it. And then, I mean, you could be fully loaded with a 20 pound payload and then you rack the pitch all the way and you notice the aircraft just, just literally pitch an additional 20 degrees, right? And it's a it's a badass sound. I mean, <laughs> it is such a badass it sound. It is, yeah. No, it was fun out in Colorado having that thing. So do you even know anybody that's flown one of these? I do not know. Well, Trent's flown one. Oh, he has. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. He's flown one. He agrees with me, by the way. I, I'm, If I know Trent, I, okay, maybe he doesn't agree with me. Let's not I put words. I would speculate that Trent would mouth. agree with me. Major yeah, I speculation. hope so. Now I got to ask him. <laughs> Major speculation. <laughs> so, uh, Trent, I got to ask you a question. Um, but no, really. I mean, if you, if you think about the amount of work that's gone into tuning with FreeFly, if they can produce their aircraft at a rate that's necessary for the consumer market, I would... I would put my money on FreeFly. But if I were to pull a Jim Cramer and say, well, that's all up in the air and we don't really know, we got to go with what's on paper, then what's on paper, I'm saying Vantage Robotics has the advantage with the Vesper. That was really lame, but I tried. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could have been worse. <laughs> yeah, it totally could have. So, Anyways, all right. What else? Uh, let's see. I mean, Is we talked about it? the Autel? Vantage Rest. Oh, yeah, the Autel Evo 2, 2 Dual. I would argue that the Autel Evo 2 is probably the closest in competition to the DJI aircraft. Um, my, Speaking about the Mavic specifically? Correct. Because yeah, it's yeah, similar yeah. design, et cetera? And thank you for clarifying that. Um, but there's one really... There's one thing about that aircraft I wish they would change, which is a sensor denied flight mode. You know, we've had Bill on the show from the NTSB talking about the importance of attitude mode, talking about the importance of a sensor denied flight mode. If you want to use um, uh, the other terminology, the other flight controllers terminology, manual mode, whatever. That said, um, it's probably got the most features as far as video is concerned, as far as dual sensors with having a really good video sensor is concerned. Um, it's the closest to the Mavic. Now, if you think about the absolute c comparison, you're looking at a Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual Advanced and an Autel Evo 2 Dual, right? And if the information, Autel Evo 2 Dual, if the information that we have been given, yes, look, that's right, uh, is correct, which I just looked it up, you're paying $3,000 more for the Autel drone. Is um, that FLIR camera not worth extra? We've got the same exact one here in the... Uh, it is the same exact mm -hmm. one? Oh, yep, right. yep. So, mm -hmm. so that's, a, that's a no. Yeah, it's a hard no. It's a hard pass for me. <laughs> um, now, here's the thing. I uh, Someone actually, look at this, uh, on Adorama, someone wrote a comment about the Autel Evo tool, to dual, excuse me, uh, giving DJI a run for their, their money. On thermal resolution, flight capabilities, and ease of use, it is by far the best that I have ever used outside of DJI, coming from the Inspire 
fire Matrice with FLIR mounted lens. The Mavic 2 Dual, this system has taken the best of those units and wrapped it into one solid platform. And so I, I would agree that the, the next best thing from DJI is probably the Autel Evo 2 Dual. Um, there's definitely some safety uh, issues. You know, I, I keep bringing these safety issues up because just like with Skydio and their ability to make the pilot in charge or priority, we're talking about one line, one parameter of code, a yes or a no, an on or an off. The same exact thing goes for Autel having an attitude mode. It's an on or an off, a one or a zero. Well, when it comes to flight modes, there's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's it. So there's 10 options overall. But that's for writing code on these things. Anyway, long sure. story short is is that, you know, the next closest thing to the Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual Advance is going to be the Autel Evo 2 Dual, which, by the way, just for clarity, the camera sensor on the Vesper, which is the next closest option, is significantly less than what you would see on the Autel Evo 2 Dual, okay? It might have 48 times zoom, but it's a very small sensor. So the amount of data that's usable is going to be a lot less. Well, this was a long diatribe. I'm sorry, Rob. Um, I think the answer to his question as far as if he is in government, if he is in critical infrastructure, what could we recommend? Um, I think it's a, I, without giving one definitive answer, I think it's in this buyer's best, this pilot's best interest to compare the Vesper from Vantage Robotics to the Autel Evo 2 Dual. Mm -hmm. um, I like, one thing I do have to say about Autel is when we did that test for them at CES, it was really easy to just pull it out of the box and fly it. Yeah. It's just like DJI. I mean, it, it, they really do have that, that knocked out and sure. it's great. You like their app and, the flight well, that's, control. And and, that's the thing is that the app is so similar to DJI's yeah. Go 4. It's just, it's uh, almost synonymous to use if you've sure. been flying DJI. Like that's why I said you can literally just pick pick it up after the first flight and go for it. Um, without flying the Vesper, I wouldn't really be able to give you a hands-on in-person experience as far as how it flies. Uh, my trusty colleagues and comrades uh, say it flies like a boat. Um, but most drones, but. most drones that I say, but because most new drones do fly like a boat, this does not fly like a boat, Rob. Well, and, and you're not buying it for videography and that kind of cinematography, right? So you don't need quite the, like if you're going to map with it or something, it's going to make pretty standard boat like movements anyways. True. Yeah. Now that said, you know, you bring up an important point, which we just talked about in props. A lot of people are doing these inspections, right? They're not doing cinematic movements. You know how many companies, though, want cinematic movements, even though you're doing an inspection? A lot. Yeah. Because they want the marketing. They want that dual value. You sure, know? sure. So, and, and to have to do that with, well, I mean, you're going to have to bring a drone down for a battery change anyway. So maybe, the, maybe you just need to have a couple of different drones when you're out in the field. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just something like a Mavic 2 Pro or something for that kind of stuff. Man, it really goes to show that uh, I think coronavirus might have given us a leg up as far as uh, the ability to have drones that compete. But these companies need to deliver. I mean, we're we're starting to see repetition of things that have happened in the past. Yeah. Um. And uh, anyway, so I, it's exciting though, right? I mean, like it's it's really ex it's really exciting yeah, because I, yeah, more to learn. More to learn. There's a lot of players out there. They're they're designing and building cool stuff. Definitely need to see them in the market. But I they're they're I'm just not going to go so far as to say, as a whole in particular, they're the the next 3DR. I mean that's that's crazy. Well, I mean it is a podcast. This is partly entertainment too, Rob. <laughs> Look, here's the question for you. Okay, would you rather prefer mean tweets or gas at two dollars a gallon? I rest my case. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, if you don't get that, it's probably good. Uh, but long story short is I don't think Skydio <laughs> is the next 3DR. Okay. Okay. I don't think that. I just think what I, what I think a lot of people fail to understand is that I, I really want Skydio to succeed. Competition is good for the pilot no matter what. Although when manufacturers are... Uh, <sighs> promising a future of American aircraft intelligence and they're selling the population population short 
and it's as simple as a software change. Um, you have a company running off of ego, not running off of servicing their clients. And when there are congressional meetings going on about how America's national intelligence um, and national security is being affected by drones, then yes, I think it's I think it's a hill worth dying on. Oh well, you just might. <laughs> yeah, but I hope not. I really hope not. Uh, but um, all right. But no, no, no. The, my my point to wrap my to my point is this: is right, is the U.S. government says we need American-made drones, okay? And Skydio is saying we are the ones most capable of doing it as far as mass production, as far as consumer capability, etc. That is true. What is not true, though, is that these drones are truly safe and they're as capable as other drones. So let's not set up America to fail. Let's get let's drop the egos and just make a simple flight parameter change. Add a button. Done. Problem solved. All right. Let's uh, let's I think we've answered his question. We have, and I hope that we did a good job of answering we, this question. I think we did. As far as American drones are concerned, I'm excited. I really am. Um, my favorite right now is still Free Fly. Okay. I mean, I, I really look. You got the Alta. You mean or like? Uh, no, the Astro. I mean, like Free Fly as a company in general. I think that they have what it takes to really build a competitive aircraft on features and price. I just don't think that they're there yet. This is kind of like Kramer we'll see. discussing Snowflake or Palantir, right? I mean, like, you know, Skydio produces more than Palantir, right? But Snowflake, I mean, they, they got what it takes. So <laughs> anyway. If you want some stock advice, buy them both. And get leaps. <laughs> On that bombshell, that's going to do it for us today. I have upset Rob once again. My yeah, name is it. Paul. <laughs> My name is... What would a show be? Uh. <laughs> All right, guys. Love you. Uh, see you guys have later. Have a great day. <laughs>